Interested in nature and really driven to field observation of, of natural history, um, and not just birds. I mean, Louis no. is a big expert. Oh, that's right. Am I okay to do that then? Yeah, Is that going to get yeah. in your room? Someone's asking. Uh, it probably would be yeah. better for yeah. you. So I'll do that. Does that make um, sense? Yeah, of course, of course. I'll just go yeah. sit there. And you're okay to just. And as well as that, um, field, uh, yeah, passion and time spent in the field. Um, Louis also has enormous skills on the desktop and coming to quantitative analysis of data and increasingly analyzing big data, which I think is you know the real frontier in biodiversity uh, science now. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Louis. So take it away. Thanks very much. Louis. Thanks, Rich. Um, good morning, everyone. So it's it's a great pleasure to be here today and to present to a really diverse group of people um, that have come to see me talk. Uh, so yeah, for those who don't know me, um, my name's Louis and I've just completed my honours here. Uh, Rich is my supervisor, which he graciously didn't mention. Um, and in this seminar, I'm going to present the results of my honours, but I'm also going to put it in the broader context of really citizen science uh, in ornithology and also in kind of more applied spaces in conservation and looking at the challenges associated with that, uh, the successes we've had already and some of the opportunities that the citizen science can provide. Um, I think it's helpful to start any talk like this by defining what citizen science is. The problem, however, is that there have been a lot of people that try to do that um, over the past few decades, and there's no real consensus as to what citizen science actually is. Uh, Alan Irwin first coined the term uh, in 1995, and he said that citizen science is anything, uh, any kind of science which assists the needs and concerns of citizens, and importantly, is developed and enacted by the citizens themselves. Uh, a more basic definition comes from Silvertown. 2009, who says that a citizen scientist is any volunteer who collects or processes data as part of a scientific inquiry. And more recently, Eitzel et al. Uh, in 2017 went really broad and just said that citizen science is anything that includes members of the public in some aspect of scientific research. Uh, so that's really broad. And I think at this point that the field is broadening and broadening. And you can probably just say at, right now that citizen science is anything that you know it when you see it, um, which is not really helpful. But that's where we're at. Uh, what's more, citizen science has a really long history. Many major conservation organizations that aim to engage the public with biodiversity and conservation are more than a century old. In the United States, the National Audubon Society was founded in 1905. In uh, Australia, BirdLife Australia has its origins around Federation in 1901. And in the UK, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds dates back to 1889. But in many ways, uh, the origins of citizen science go back further still. Uh, prior to the professionalization of science in the 20th, uh, the 20th century, I should say, almost all of those interested in science, particularly in natural history, were amateurs. Um, indeed, Charles Darwin, who got here, was on the Beagle as a volunteer. He wasn't paid for that privilege. Uh, and so in that sense, you could call him uh, one of the early citizen scientists. And indeed, you can really date back uh, the history of public engagement in science well back, uh, well back into, the, into the early um, millennia. Um, and indeed, people have always been interested in science and, and nature especially holds a massive fixation in kind of the community psyche. And so people have always sought ways to engage with the process of science and nature, regardless of their level of expertise. And I think it's this engagement that drives not only the organizational success of the, the organizations like are on the board, but also of the citizen science programs that they themselves coordinate. So two long running examples of this, the Christmas bird count uh, and the North American breeding bird survey. Uh, the Christmas bird count was uh, started in 1900 and has run every single year since then with about 100,000 participants each year in the last couple of years. Uh, similarly, the North American Breeding Bird Survey, which is a bit more structured than the Christmas bird count, has run since 1966 and has comprehensive coverage across the entire uh, United States and Canada with more than 3,000 routes regularly surveyed by amateur birders. Despite the long history of citizen science though, as a concept, it's really hit a new stride in the 21st century. And I think the primary factor behind this newfound renaissance is undoubtedly the internet, which has 
uh, massively increased the accessibility of science for naturalists, uh, for, for members of the public, and allowed for much more engagement both ways between members of the public and amateurs and professional scientists. Citizen science is also increasingly being accepted uh, as a genuine type of science, particularly in fields such as biology and astronomy. This is reflected by the exponential growth in the number of publications in the literature that reference or, or rely on citizen science. As you can see here on the left, reproduced by Follett and Strazov. This uh, graph is actually about 10 years old now, and I can guarantee you that exponential growth has continued in the past decade. And indeed, the story of citizen science in the 21st century is one of exponents, um, because not only is the research output growing exponentially, but the volume of data that we're collecting as citizen scientists is also growing at an ever increasing rate. This is best exemplified, I think, by the growth of the eBird data set over the past uh, 20 years since its launch in the early 2000s. eBird is now the world's largest database of citizen science records and has grown exponentially since its launch in the early 2000s to the point where now, uh, in 2020, there were more than 150 million bird observations entered from around the world. It's also so successful that it's now responsible for just under half of all of the observations in the Global Biodiversity uh, Information Facility. So it's pretty significant. For the rest of this talk, then, I'm going to focus on citizen science in the field of biology and mainly on programs that collect occurrence records of wild organisms like iNaturalist, like eBird. Uh, there are an enormous diversity of such programs around the world and more are launching every year. Uh, and this is equally true within Australia. Unsurprisingly, the largest program um, by far in Australia is eBird, which is responsible for more than 31 million bird occurrence records in the Atlas of Living Australia. Uh, the local counterpart or equivalent of eBird, which is bird data administered by BirdLife Australia, uh, is increasingly being cannibalized by its, its more American cousin, but it still has 11 million records in the Atlas. And so it's still a force to be reckoned with, with a lot of earlier data that the eBird doesn't have that temporal coverage of. Uh, another one to watch out for is iNaturalist, which is probably of these four experiencing the most rapid growth. Uh, it covers a much more broad taxonomic scope than the other three on the board and has uh, already 3 million occurrence records. And I think when I actually looked last night, um, the Atlas is outdated and there's about four and a half million on iNaturalist itself. Uh, finally, Frog ID, which only launched in 27 and is still very much in the, the kind of the early stages of its growth, already has 147,000 frog records, uh, expert validated from all around Australia. Uh, that's run by the Australian Museum and has been exceptionally popular in recent years. Uh, and indeed, citizen science is now so popular that in 2019, it was responsible for about seven eighths of all of the observations entered into the Atlas of Living Australia for that year. Uh, eBird itself makes up 75% of that total just on its own. Both of these figures, the 75% and the 7 eighths figure, are almost certain to grow throughout the years as uh, citizen science grows as a concept and outpaces the growth of traditional sources of data like structured monitoring programs that also enter into the Atlas of Living Australia. So given the exponential growth we see in just about every citizen science program at the moment, I think it's really something to say about the sheer engagement of amateur naturalists around the country. And the immense popularity of citizen science, at least among citizens, presents some fantastic opportunities. It also brings a number of challenges. Opportunities and challenges are both well uh, discussed in the references at the bottom here, if you're interested, and indeed in the literature more broadly. But I think each can be lumped into about four kind of broad themes. And the question, therefore, is how do we exploit these opportunities that you see on the left and address the challenges to drive success in the field? So citizen science brings great potential to contribute to pure science, uh, for example, by contributing to studies on the distribution, abundance, phenology, and behavior of organisms. It also brings many opportunities to contribute to more applied fields, such as conservation. For instance, citizen science can provide information on changes in the state of biodiversity and ultimately can inform management decisions. There's also a strong body of research showing that the uh, benefits of citizen science uh, that it provides with respect to outreach and science communication, because engaging members of the public with the scientific process can increase scientific literacy and confidence in the scientific process and empower participants with new knowledge and skills that they can then use in their day-to-day -day life. Uh, so in terms of the challenges faced by citizen science, let's start from there. Uh, by and large, these relate to the acceptance of uh, citizen science within the scientific community, especially, and thus they mainly affect the first two challenges on the left here. Uh, the classification of challenges comes from this paper by Hilary Burgess uh, and colleagues from 2017. 
Uh, the first major challenge is source preferences. So many researchers uh, just have an inherent preference for data that is collected either by themselves or by an institution that they trust. So maybe the institution they work at or a, a government organization, for instance. Um, the second challenge is data quality, and that's a big one. There is a common perception that data collected by citizen scientists, i.e. amateurs, is of diminished quality relative to that uh, produced by alternative sources, such as those uh, collected by professional scientists. The third uh, challenge that citizen science faces is simply awareness. Uh, a, a, a scientist is not going to use a citizen science data set if they don't know that it exists and that it is appropriate for their needs. Um, the final major challenge is that of suitability, because ultimately there are some scientific questions that don't lend themselves well to citizen science answers and kind of vice versa. And so there will always be a need for the traditional scientific method as employed by professionals. But really the question then is, to what extent can we also augment that with uh, the scientific method as employed by amateurs in citizen science. And so my work this year, I really wanted to focus on the first two opportunities and particularly as they relate to the challenges faced uh, associated with data quality. And so that's what the rest of this talk is really gonna uh, dive into. And indeed the, the workshop afterwards will also look at a lot of data quality questions. So the reason for this is that data quality concerns significantly limit the utility of citizen science. Indeed, that paper by uh, Hilary Burgess found that researchers who chose not to use citizen science data in their own work felt skeptical of it and uh, believed that not only are the data of lower quality, but even if they are of decent quality, they're more difficult to publish relative to that collected uh, by professional scientists. And so as you can see there are barriers to the use of citizen science in professional science at every step of the process because even if you have an appropriate citizen science data set for your needs and even if you're confident in the quality of that data set yourself you then have to convince uh, a peer reviewer a journal editor and probably like later on in the track in an applied sense a government practitioner of that quality as well and if it fails at any point in the process your work is essentially useless because it's, it's not getting the impact that it needs I was curious, however, as to the extent to which these beliefs actually stack up against what the literature says with regard to the quality of citizen science data. And the short answer is that no, they really don't stack up. Um, there are some concerns that you have to address when you're looking at citizen science data, but by and large, these beliefs are over-exaggerated. Uh, the long answer is a lot more complicated and is kind of what I devoted my research to uh, throughout the year to investigate. And so I'll present the results of this year's research now, and then close at the end by placing all of this research back in the broader context of the field. Uh, so in an attempt to arrive at the long answer, I had two broad aims for my honest work. Um, first, what are the biases found in citizen science data sets? And second, how can we, uh, and, and how can we quantify them? And second, what effects do these biases have on modeling and how do we address these effects when we are constructing models to apply to citizen science data? Uh, before we move into what is, I guess, the more dense part of this uh, seminar, let me preface it by saying that there will be a fair amount of statistics involved. Uh, if that scares you too much, don't worry. I've got plenty of bird pictures on the other side of the slides uh, to distract you from the scary stuff. So don't just deep breaths. Okay. Um, so you, you might be wondering what I say. Have I even said biases? Yes, I have. Uh, what I mean when I say biases. Uh, there are lots of different biases, types of biases that can be found in citizen science data sets. And that, that word gets bandied around a lot when people are saying, oh, citizen science data is crap. It's got so many biases. Um, but indeed, there are biases in every kind of observational data set. But I chose specifically to explore sampling biases. And essentially, a sampling bias is the non-random bias distribution of sampling effort uh, across either space or time. You can see an illustration of spatial bias here on the right. Uh, I'll work on this screen. Um, so showing the distribution of uh, observations in eBird around Brisbane city. If the distribution of observations were to be unbiased, we would expect to see uh, an equal number or roughly equal number of observations in each of these grid cells. But instead what we see is we see some areas of low sampling effort, like in the Northwest around the Dagula range, and indeed some cells have zero observations. And then we see some concentrations of high sampling effort. Uh, there's a few around the city, but in particular, this kind of northeast coast around things like uh, Dow's wetland, um, Dow's lagoon, Tinchy Tampa wetlands are really popular with birders. And so they get over visited and have a correspondingly very high number of uh, observations in the data set. Um, Note also that I presented this map with a logarithmic scale. So the real pattern, the real disparity in sampling effort is actually more extreme, but I've, I've pulled out the low areas so you can see that there is some data there. Um, and importantly, these biases are always driven by human behavior. Uh, citizen scientists being in this case of eBird, primarily recreational birders, uh, make observations in their spare time. And they make 
subconscious and conscious decisions about when and where they want to bird. And so uh, these observations tend to be non-random and thus we get non-random distributions of sampling effort across space and time. Uh, it's also well established in the citizen science literature that biases can cause incorrect inferences during modeling. So consider, for example, two hypothetical species, one which preferentially occupies our northwest area with low sampling effort and one which preferentially occupies our northeast area, which has high sampling effort. Even if the two species were equally abundant in their habitats, due to the undersampling of this northwest area and the oversampling of the northeast, we would expect to see different numbers of raw observations uh, for each species in the data set. Uh, if this disparity in sampling effort isn't accounted for during our modeling process, we run the risk of making an incorrect uh, inference about the relative abundance of those two species. And you can kind of expand that up conceptually to more complicated things, and, and we'll get to that uh, later as well. So pursuant to my aims, I then took, uh, I undertook three main studies throughout this year to determine the nature and the impact of biases in citizen science data. Firstly, I devised a method of quantifying biases in a nice, easy, repeatable way, both spatial and temporal biases. I applied this method of quantifying biases to the eBird data set within Brisbane for a nice local bent, and then I analyzed the results. Uh, secondly, I simulated some bias data, and I tested the effects of these simulated biases on some simple models that I applied to that data set. Uh, and then finally, I kind of combined the first uh, and the second uh, components of this work to test the effect of real world biases on the EBA, in the eBird data set on models as applied to that same data set. So for the first and second parts of the uh, first and third parts of this work, I should say, I looked at the eBird data set uh, specifically within Brisbane City. eBird is, uh, as I'm sure you're probably aware of, exceptionally popular within Brisbane, and it continues to grow year on year, just as the platform does worldwide. More than 400 bird species have been recorded from Brisbane by more than 3,000 unique users across more than 2 million individual bird occurrence records. It should be noted, however, that my methods are easily transferable to just about any other similarly structured data set or component of, an, of a larger data set, be that from citizen science or otherwise. And I would encourage anyone who's interested in conducting such uh, an analysis on a data set from citizen science to, uh, or of their choice rather to, to reach out to me and we can talk about that. So for my investigation of sampling biases, which was the first part of the work, I looked at the Brisbane EBA data set and compared the observed and the expected distributions of sampling effort across several spatial and temporal scales. And by comparing these two distributions, a measure of bias can be estimated. So if sampling is unbiased, the observed distribution of effort across this axis will overlap with the expected distribution. If, however, there's some kind of systematic bias in the, in the, uh, the axis, we would expect to see a lack of overlap and a, and a disjunction between the two, uh, the two distributions of sampling effort, such as you see here on the right. So this, this can be presented visually like you see here, or it can be summarized into a single measure of bias, which ranges from zero to one where zero is no bias, which is to say complete overlap between the observed and expected distributions. And one is kind of infinite bias or a complete lack of overlap uh, between the two distributions. That'll make more sense when we go into the results. For the second part, uh, the simulation study, I simulated some very simple spatially and temporally biased presence absence data. And then I tested the performance of various generalized linear models under a number of different scenarios encapsulating different types of bias. And for the final part of the study, I ran the same set of generalized linear models on three uh, on, on the real world Brisbane eBird data set for 157 of the most common species in the city. And then I compared the agreement between each of the three models so as to interrogate the effects that biases might have on the inferences we make from these models on citizen science data. So these two processes, the, the, the simulation study and the applied analysis, allowed me to investigate my second aim, which was to determine the extent to which biases in citizen science data actually cause problems during modeling. Onto the results then, and looking first at some of the temporal biases that I found in the Brisbane data set. So across years, you can see this really consistent increase in sampling effort driven by the growing popularity of the platform over the past decade. Under uniform sampling, one would expect to see roughly the same number of uh, sampling uh, events in every year as illustrated in red. But instead, what we see in the blue is this exponential increase over time. And across months, there's a, a much less significant pattern. So we see some level of intermonthly variation in sampling effort, uh, January in particular stands out as a month that has received much more sampling effort than we would otherwise expect. Uh, and this is likely due to a number of things, uh, primarily people's increased availability for recreational activities like birding during the summer holidays and increased motivation for birding at the start of the year due to things like New Year's resolutions and uh, birding big years. Um, ask Rich about what a birding big year is. 
uh, across days, uh, the immediate effect of weekends can be seen. So given that bird watching is primarily a recreational activity, people tend to have a lot more time for such things during the weekends when they're not working. And so we see increased sampling effort on Saturdays and Sundays relative to the other five days of the week. This phenomenon is actually found in just about every citizen science data set, whether it's in biology or not, and is known as the weekend bias in the literature. Um, finally, throughout the day, we see this really strong diurnal pattern of sampling effort. Um, this is pretty unsurprising. The, the pattern closely matches a lot of things. It closely matches when people are available because they like to go birding before and after work, but it also matches the activity patterns of most birds. So there's a big dawn chorus when people go out and they, they look at that dawn chorus, and there's a smaller uh, dusk chorus, and then there's very little sampling effort throughout the night. Um, this is fairly unsurprising, but it does show that there is uh, still non-random sampling effort throughout the time of day. Moving now on to spatial biases, and we'll look first at the distribution of sampling biases across Brisbane's elevational gradient. So most of Brisbane city lies well under 100 metres of elevation. Uh, there's a few mountains in the northwest of the city that reach up to about 700 metres of altitude, um, leading to this really kind of skewed distribution that we see here in red. Interestingly, the observed distribution of sampling, however, is even more skewed, but it's skewed in both directions. So we see an oversampling of the very, very lowest areas of the city, uh, in, in kind of zero to 20 meters of elevation. But we also see, if you look here closely, an oversampling of the very highest peaks of the city. Now, that, that blue bar is very small, but relative to the red bar there, which is minuscule, it's actually massively oversampled. And that's because people like to go to these upland rainforest areas that we see in Brisbane. And so they are oversampled relative to this really tiny area of land that they cover in the city. Uh, looking next at the distribution of sampling across the protected areas in Brisbane, we can see that about 15% of Brisbane is covered in a, by a protected area, uh, with the remaining 85% or so of the land cover being unprotected land. And interestingly, protected areas are actually undersampled. They've received about 40% of the sampling effort that we would otherwise expect based on the coverage that they have in the city. Um, this is actually quite a novel result, as most studies in other locations have found that protected areas tend to be oversampled. Citizen scientists preferentially go to protected areas because they perceive them to be of higher biodiversity value. Uh, the opposite pattern is seen here in Brisbane, but there is a simple explanation for this. The majority of protected land in Brisbane lies in the Dagula National Park, which is for the most part quite hard to access, and it has no public roads running through it uh, other than one kind of on, along the edge. And it's also fairly homogeneous in terms of the habitat types and the bird assemblages it provides. So there's little reason for a recreational birder to go very far into the Dagula National Park when they can see the same set of birds more easily in other locations. And so that's why we see, I think, this kind of undersampling of protected areas in the city. Uh, I think that's Gold Creek Reservoir or something. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I can, I can go, there's, I think there's actually a few there, I'll, I'll explain that at the end, but it is interesting. Um, the third spatial scale that I looked at uh, sampling effort across was habitat. So I classified Brisbane into six really broad habitat types that you can see here, built up dry forest, estuary, non-remnant, wet forest, and wetland. And then I looked at each, uh, whether each was overall undersampled relative to the area of land that it covers in the city. Um, and you can, e you can immediately see some really significant variation in the relative sampling effort rates. So built up areas, which is to say kind of anywhere with a building on or near it, uh, they're very undersampled. And this is, shouldn't be that surprising, uh, given that such areas tend to have very low biodiversity value and are of consequently limited interest to recreational birders. Dry forests are also undersampled, but probably for a different reason. Uh, the majority of dry forest in the city lies in the Daegula National Park, which as we saw on the previous slide, is itself undersampled due to the difficulty in accessing most of it. And the fact that dry forests are really kind of boring in terms of bird assemblages. Uh, conversely, estuary, feel free to disagree with me. Estuary, non-remnant and wetland habitats are really oversampled with wetlands being especially so, as you can see here. It's kind of two and a half times the sampling effort we would otherwise expect. Um, this is actually also not that surprising. Wetlands tend to have high diversity, uh, interesting birds, and are also often very accessible to birders of all abilities, meaning that they receive high visitation rates and are correspondingly overrepresented in an eBird data set, which is driven primarily by recreational users. So that's what I found when I explored the biases that were actually present in the eBird data set. And moving on to the simulation study now, because what point is there to knowing that these biases exist in the data sets if you don't actually know what the effects are when you're trying to use that data? So I simulated six different uh, data sets, each with different combinations of spatial and temporal biases. I applied three different generalized linear models to each of these simulations. Uh, the, the models we had varying complexity, so I've called one simple, intermediate, uh, and complex. 
Um, and, and then I looked at how each of these models performed relative to the actual truth of what I was simulating in that scenario. And that has just really destroyed um, that image in the compression. So I will talk to it. Uh, so just to show some of these results, um, I have summarized graphs for just the fifth and the sixth scenarios, which are kind of the most complicated in terms of the biases. So in the fifth scenario, um, you're just going to have to trust me because there's like four pixels there. Uh, we have a species that exists across three habitats, which I called red, green, and blue for simplicity. Um, and the species is declining in the uh, it's declining in the green and the blue habitats, and it's staying stable in the red habitat. Uh, green and blue overlap to this kind of teal color. Um, there is a temporal bias, so there's an increase in the sampling effort across the time, uh, a linear increase, and there's also uh, a spatial bias. So the the um, red habitat is undersampled relative to the area of land that it covers in this kind of hypothetical lens, uh, this simulation landscape. Um, so you can see that the three models get the overall trajectory right. They all realize that this species is declining overall, um, but only the complex model can accurately tease out those differences at the per habitat level. When we add in a, 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 a change in the spatial bias over time in the sixth scenario, what we see is when we oversample the red habitat throughout time. So at the start uh, of the simulation, the red habitat is undersampled. And by the end of it, it's actually oversampled. Our most simple model completely gets it wrong. It thinks that this, this species is increasing because of that oversampling of a habitat in which the species is common and not declining. Fortunately, however, our more complex model can still tease out all of these differences and it can still work out what's happening at a per habitat level. And so this is actually quite an interesting result. Well, because it means that if we have some kind of careful model selection, we can tease out the biases in the data and we can still arrive at something that we think is uh, approaching or, or in fact, in this case, is the truth in terms of what is happening in our data sets. So looking then at the same set of models as applied to the real world data from the EBER data set, I looked at 10-year trends in detection for 157 species uh, in each of the six habitat types I classified earlier. So 157 times 6 is 942. Two. And so I had 942 trends to compare between the two models, uh, the three models, I should say. Um, for brevity, I'm only going to discuss the comparison between the more simple and the more complex models. Um, but you can, and you can see a matrix of these comparisons on the right. So in uh, 469, or just under 50% of cases, the two models agreed as to the long-term trend in that data set. So uh, in 315 cases, they both agreed that the species was declining in that habitat. In 51, they both agreed that there was no significant change. And in 103 cases, they both agreed that the species was increasing in detectability. Uh, in another 379 or 40% of cases, there, there was ambiguity. So one model de uh, detected a significant change and the other didn't detect a significant change. Uh, and so that's these orange uh, or yellowy squares here. Most concerningly, however, is the 94 or 10% of cases for which the two models significantly differed in their trend estimate. So one estimated a significant decline over the 10 year period and the other a significant increase. And this represents a serious concern for anyone wanting to use a citizen science data set for conservation purposes. Because how can you be confident in your trend estimation if you know for a fact that different models are gonna give you different results about what's happening? So to summarize the results of my honors work then, I found that there are sampling biases present in the eBird data set, and these biases vary across spatial and temporal scales, and many of them are different to those found in other data sets or in other locations, like, for example, the undersampling of protected areas in Brisbane. I also found that, uh, the, that these biases can greatly affect our model inferences. Conflicting model results are a major cause for concern and represent a serious barrier to the usage of citizen science data in conservation and indeed broader science. And these findings have uh, many implications for the use of citizen science as uh, applied to research and management. As everyone in this room can no doubt agree, the conservation decisions that we make need to be robust, which means that the data sets we use and the models that we apply to those data sets must also be robust. But how can we know if our model results are accurate, given that the biases presence are the, given the biases present in most of the citizen science data sets that we see? So I recommend that analysts consider the biases that may be present in their data sets prior to conducting any modeling with such data. And I also suggest that the results that they get from citizen science data need to be interpreted with care so as to ensure that they're accurate. Uh, also where possible, comparing results from multiple data sets should be considered good practice. So where does that leave the field? Um, so I looked at one big challenge this year, biases in citizen science data sets. I found that they do exist and that they do affect the models that we apply to those data sets. As I addressed earlier, there are many other challenges. Some have received lots of research attention and others very little. 
Citizen science needs to be able to address each of these if it is to stand on equal footing with more traditional scientific methods. I did, however, have some success. Uh, in particular, I found, as have many others doing similar work, that smart model design can account and mitigate most biases. There's also plenty of scope at other stages of the process, for instance, during the early stages of designing a citizen science program, to incorporate other methodological tricks and, and tools that can increase the robustness of your results and your data sets. And as for opportunities, I think they really are endless. Uh, citizen science shows no signs of slowing down in its growth. And even if scientists were to wholly reject any data that is collected by members of the public, there would still be citizen scientists because there will always be people interested in the natural world. And I think it's ultimately us, up to us then as researchers to work out the best ways of harnessing this passion and turning it into work that benefits everyone, uh, scientists, the community and nature itself. And that's how I'd like to close. Uh, I'd finally like to thank uh, three people on this board. So Rich Fuller, who's been my principal supervisor this year, and Corey Callahan and Ali Johnston, who have been uh, amazing help in analyzing this data and really putting all of the citizen science uh, to good use. So yeah, thanks.